Good morning, everybody. My name is Halim Sa. I serve as one of the pastors and elders here at the Stone. We just finished a three-week series on church membership and what it means to be a partner here at the Stone. And we'll do that several times throughout the year. We'll preach on different topics that the elders believe are pertinent and needed for our church body to hear and to be equipped with. But as many of you know, our normal way of preaching is preaching through books of the Bible, right? And we're currently in the book of Mark, but back in October of 2009, we started preaching through the book of Genesis. And it was an amazing journey. We taught it through the lens of seeing the gospel in the Old Testament. That the entirety of the Old Testament, including the book of Genesis, exists to point us to the person of Jesus. That it's a pattern, a pointer, a tutor to the gospel. But we didn't get to finish the book. We just had one story left, the story of Joseph. And so starting this week and for four weeks, we're going to finish that story. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 37, and we'll get there in a bit. It's the first Sunday of summer, so we thought we started out light, right, by talking about the sovereignty of God over suffering and evil. Um, you know, there are calamities that happen in this world, whether it's the personal calamity of cancer or the global calamity of a tsunami that causes a question to force its way up from our very gut and up to our lips. Questions like, is there a God out there? Questions like, is he for real? Questions like, is he alive? Does he love us? Is he good? Right? Questions that when unbelievers think about it, some of the greatest barriers that exist in their hearts and being able to answer those questions properly is what theologians and philosophers call the problem of evil. The problem of evil. You know, as Christians, we would say that God is real. He does exist. He's alive, and not only is he alive, but he's good, and he, love us, and he loves us. But the world would look at us and ask, okay, but how could a good God allow suffering and evil in this world? How could a good God allow tsunamis to happen? How could a good God let my mom die of cancer? Not just die, but suffer and die. How could a good God just sit there and let my marriage fall apart? How could a good God let parents bury their children? If he's good, and if he's all powerful, he could have done something, right? He could have stopped it, he could have intervened, but he didn't. If God is good, and if he is real, why is there murder, cancer, genocide, human trafficking of little girls? Why is there so much evil and suffering in this world if God is real, and he is good. And if we're honest, these aren't just the questions of unbelievers. There are questions as well. We're just well behaved and keep them, to, keep them to ourselves. And so whether a believer or not, we will all have moments when we find ourselves in the dark and you feel more alone and more forsaken than you ever imagined possible. Some of you are going through it right now. Every one of us, believer or not, will one day have to answer the question, where is God when it all falls apart? Where is God when it all falls apart? Is he real? Does he exist? Is he good? Does he love us? And the way we answer that question is going to determine the trajectory of our lives. The way you answer that question is going to determine whether the inescapable the inescapable suffering and evil of this world will drive you to God or away from God. And so in a lot of these maddening questions of life, some people come to terms and conclude that God is dead. Perhaps the seeming silence from heaven sounds so deafening because there really is no one up there. Maybe God is a figment of our imagination. Maybe he's just a fantasy. And his absence in the midst of suffering and evil reveals him to be just that. Others conclude that God is cruel. They believe that he's real and he exists, but he's definitely not good. 
He is a cruel God playing a game of world domination, and he's going to make your life into a living hell if you don't do exactly what he tells you to do. Still others conclude that he's hands off, that he's agnostic, that he's wound up our lives like some cosmic wind up toy, and he's watching out of curiosity, but when bad things happen, he's just as surprised as we are, but he just doesn't care enough to intervene or act in any way. As Christians, though, we wouldn't dare come to any of those conclusions, and so most of us come up with our own solution. When those moments of pain and suffering come, and God is seemingly silent, we tell our friends and we tell each other that God is mysterious. That God is mysterious, that no one can know why these bad things happen in the world, that we can't know what God is thinking, that his ways are higher than our ways, right? And we dare not question him. Well, God is mysterious, and there are 10,000 things that God is doing that we are not told. But there are also 10,000 things that God is doing that we are told. And I think as Christians, we run too easily and too quickly to the mystery of God and miss out on the depth of his wisdom and his beauty that reveals to us in the scriptures. And when it comes to the problem of evil in the world, God is not silent. He's revealed to us much on the matter. And the story of Joseph's life in the last part of Genesis, that may be better than any other narrative in the Bible in teaching us about the sovereignty of God over suffering and evil. And so let's look at Genesis chapter 37, starting with verse 1. Jacob, in the land of his father's sojournings, in the land of Canaan, and these are the gen generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report to them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheep arose, stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheep. His brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. And when he told it to his brother, father and his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. In Genesis 37, we're introduced to a young man named Joseph. If you know the end of the story, you may know Joseph to be a man of purity that runs from the temptation of Potiphar's wife, a man of great faith and wisdom that God uses to not only save Israel, but the known world from a great famine. But when we're introduced to him here in Genesis chapter 37, he's just a 17-year-old kid. And the very first action the Bible records of Joseph is him being a tattletale. And verse 2 tells us that he was watching over the flocks with his brothers, and he came and gave his daddy a bad report about his brothers. And commentators say that whenever this bad report is used in the Hebrew, it always, always means a false report. And so we see Joseph here lying or at the very least giving a false representation of some kind to make his brothers look bad. We're also told that out of Jacob's 12 sons, Joseph was his favorite. Verse 3 tells us that Jacob loved Joseph more than any of the other sons. And verse 4 tells us that he showed it by making him a robe of many colors. The Hebrew could also be translated as a robe with long sleeves, but that wouldn't make a very good musical. So we'll leave it with the colors. 
The point is that Jacob lavished his love and his gift upon Joseph, and Joseph in a way became an idol in Jacob's life. So if the lies and the fancy gifts weren't reasons enough for his brothers to hate Joseph, Joseph also had these dreams. Joseph told his brothers that he had his dream that his brothers were bowing down to him. So in verse 8 it says that they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And then Joseph had another dream where even the sun and the moon were bowing down to him. And since he got such a glowing review the first time, he decided to tell his brothers and his father about the dream. And so at the very least, Joseph is a social moron, right? He doesn't know that what he's saying and doing is hurting people. You may know people like that. If you don't, you may be one of those people. <laughs> We're at the worst. Joseph is becoming an arrogant and prideful evil person. Even though Joseph is Jacob's favorite, when Jacob hears about the dream, it's too much even for him. And he rebukes Joseph. And so why such aggressive responses to these dreams? Well, besides the fact that these dreams were ridiculous and would be ridiculous in any time and culture, it was especially ridiculous, and not only that, but offensive to an ancient Near East culture that, were, that was hi highly hierarchical and patriarchal. And all of this is written down for us to set up why Joseph was about to have a really bad day. The Hebrew narrative is pretty spare and it doesn't repeat things unnecessarily or give unneeded details. But in verses four, five, and eight, it says over and over again that Joseph's brothers hated him. Hate was brewing in their hearts to the point that they're going to do something about it. The story goes on, Jacob sends Joseph to track down his brothers who are herding sheep. But as Joseph nears their usual spot, he can't find them can't find his brothers anywhere. Coincidentally, out of nowhere, out in the middle of nowhere, Joseph runs into a man. And coincidentally, this man happens to ask Joseph, hey Joseph, what are you looking for? And coincidentally, this man happened to be where his brothers were earlier. And coincidentally, this man happened to overhear where his brothers were going. So Joseph goes after his brothers. The brothers see Joseph approaching off in the distance and they make a plan to kill him. Reuben, the oldest, jumps in and suggests that instead of killing him, they just throw him in a pit to die. It may sound worse, but in his head, Reuben is making a plan to go back and rescue Joseph later. The brothers listen to him because Reuben is the oldest. Genesis 37, verse 23. And when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. And the word stripped here is a very strong word which has connotations to skinning an animal. And so the robe was violently ripped off of him, and he was probably thrown naked into the empty cistern. The word threw it's not a generic word either. It's a word that means dump a dead body into a grave. And if this Hebrew word is ever used of a living person, it means to abandon them to death. And then the brothers sat down to eat. And then the brothers sat down to eat. Take just a second to wrap your minds around the degree of evil that's being poured out on Joseph here. His brothers just threw him in a pit to die. But instead of feeling any guilt or remorse, they just sit down to eat, revealing just how at peace they were about what they've just done. Well, coincidentally, as they're about to dig in, they see a caravan, a procession of Egyptian travelers coming down the road, and an idea begins to stir in Judah's head, and Judah says, you know what, if we kill him, it doesn't do anybody any good. Why don't we just sell him off to the Egyptians, that way we get rid of him and we make some cash in the process, right? And after all, he is our brother, we don't have to kill him, right? Meanwhile, Reuben has gone off to rescue Joseph out of the pit like he planned. The only problem is that circumstance has once again intervened to work against Joseph. And with the timing of this whole thing, Reuben has missed his window of opportunity. Joseph is gone. 
sold to be a slave in Egypt. What a tragic day, right? What a tragic day if you stop the story right here and ask, why did this happen, right? Just like what you and I do when something horrific happens, a tragedy happens, and we stop and we ask, why did this happen? If we stop the story here and ask, why did this happen? The only proper answer seems to be because of the sins of Joseph's brothers and life's coincidences, right? Things might have gone very differently in Joseph's life if any of those little coincidences hadn't occurred. Circumstances appear to be scheming against Joseph to produce for him a horrific day. And have you ever been there? At the end of a really bad day, replaying all the little details in your mind that happened just so and had to happen just so to produce hell for you? What if this would have happened and not that? What if I would have said this and not that? If you just look at this chapter, there's no mention of God anywhere. He never speaks. We don't see him do anything. There's no reference to God. In the book of Genesis, right, the book of Genesis where it's filled with God saying this, him saying that, God appearing here and appearing there. When we get to the tragedy of chapter 37 where we need him to show up most, he's absolutely and utterly absent. Looks a lot like when tragedy strikes us, doesn't it? Cancer is eating away at your body. The great news of pregnancy one week ends with the horror of miscarriage the next. You were sexually abused as a child. Your husband wants to leave you. There's no explanation. God seems silent. You cry out to him. Your, your pillows are stained with the tears of each dark night. Your every waking moment is spent playing the what-if game until you're driven mad, and the silence of God is unbearable. Joseph, too, cried. He screamed, and he shouted for someone to help him. He cried to his brothers. He cried out to God. He cried out in the darkness of the cistern. No one came. No one answered. But the good news is that the story doesn't end there. If you know the end of the story, you know that everything had to happen exactly the way that it happened, right? You know that everything had to happen exactly the way that it happened for this family to be saved. Joseph had to be sold off into slavery so that his pride and arrogance would be killed so that he would learn humility. His brothers had to experience the forgiveness from a brother who they so brutally betrayed so that their hatred would be killed. Jacob had to experience the loss of his favorite son so that his idolatry would be killed. God seemed silent. He seems not to be doing anything, but he was speaking and he was orchestrating every minute detail in order to save this family. So you see, everything had to happen exactly the way it happened. And though it appeared that sin and circumstance was running the show and that God was dead, he was not dead. He was very much alive. And he wasn't cruel and he wasn't hands off. He is a living God, not dead. He's good, not cruel. And he's passionately working, not hands off, in order to accomplish every detail of human history for his own glory and the salvation of his people. Now I say here, the salvation of his people, and not just the salvation of Joseph's family, because there was a famine coming. Another reason why everything had to happen exactly the way it happened was because Joseph had to be in a position of power in Egypt so that the lives of millions would be saved, not just physically, but spiritually. If things didn't happen exactly the way that it happened, the famine would have come and Jacob and his 12 sons, along with the lineage of the promised Messiah, wiped out. What does that mean? No Jesus. So in a very real way, if you're a Christian here today, if you know Jesus to be the love of your life, 
It's because God had you in mind as he was orchestrating the evil of Joseph's brothers and the suffering of Joseph. While he was doing all of that, he had your salvation in mind. And so we see a difficult yet clearly biblical truth that God's saving love for us is completely compatible in him bringing about suffering and evil in our lives. That God's saving love for us is completely compatible with him bringing about suffering and evil in our lives. And another famous story of suffering in the midst of Job's sufferings, when his wife tells him to curse God and die, he says to her in Job 2.10, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? And the author comments, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. In other words, Job did not sin in, in acknowledging the complete sovereignty of God and bringing about both good and evil in Job's life to accomplish his purposes. I know this truth is difficult, but though difficult, it's nevertheless true. God wants us to grasp that he is fully in control over everything, not just the good, but also the bad. It's something that he talks about throughout the scriptures. Deuteronomy 32, 39, God says, there's no God besides me. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded and it is I who heal. And there is no one who can deliver from my hand. It is I who put to death and give life. In other words, nobody is born into this world apart from God doing it, and nobody dies in this world apart from God doing it, no matter how tragic the death. Life belongs to God. He owes it to no one. He may give it or take it according to his infinite wisdom. Exodus 4.1, God says to Moses, when he was fearful about speaking, who has made man's mouth? Who makes him dumb, or deaf, or seeing, or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? In other words, there's not a single person in this world who has a disease or a disability that didn't ultimately receive it from God. Isaiah 45, 7 says, God is the one forming light and creating darkness, causing well-being and creating calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Amos 3.6 6, 3, 6 says, If a calamity occurs in a city, has not the Lord done it? In other words, there's not a single earthquake or a tsunami, a single falling of a skyscraper or a fire in an apartment building that befalls us that is not ultimately by God's will and His sovereign hand. Isn't that what it says, guys? If a calamity occurs in a city, has not the Lord done it? This is why Charles Spurgeon, the London pastor from 100 years ago said, I believe that every particle of dust that dances in the sunbeam does not move an atom more or less than God wishes. That every particle of spray that dashes against the steamboat has its orbit as well as the sun in the heavens that the chaff from the hand of the winnower is steered as the stars in their courses. The creeping of an aphid over the rosebud is as much fixed as the march of the devastating pestilence. The fall of leaves from a poplar is fully ordained as the tumbling of an avalanche. Nothing happens apart from God wanting it, willing it, orchestrating it, ordaining it, however way you want to say it. Even sin and suffering does not happen in this world apart from God willing it. Let me make a very important point here. In ordaining sin, God does not himself sin. In ordaining sin, God does not himself sin. In other words, God can direct an action that would be sinful for a human to do, 
but would not be guilty of the sin himself because he caused it not to accomplish evil, but to accomplish good. A very simple illustration. It's like if my son Malachi hits my daughter Evie, right? He's doing that out of evil intentions and he's going to get spanked for it, okay? But if I spank my daughter Evie because she's being a diva, right? I'm not guilty of the sin myself because I'm trying to accomplish good and not evil, right? We'll get to this in detail in the fourth week of the series, but when we get to the end of Genesis and Joseph's brothers are afraid that Joseph might take revenge upon their wrong, wronging him, he says in Genesis 50, 19 through 20, do not fear for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. And so Joseph's brothers, in doing what they did, they did evil because they meant it for evil. But the God who was orchestrating, who was sovereign over the evil of Joseph's lives, himself did no evil because he meant it for good. Right? He meant it for good, that many people should be kept alive as they are today. The scriptures are clear. We don't have to claim mystery on this. That's why it's so sad when people go through sufferings in life, and as Christians, we try to bring them comfort by trying to relieve God of his sovereignty, right? An earthquake happens and claims the lives of thousands, and when the world is seeking for answers, as Christians, what do we want to tell them? that God had nothing to do with it. Why is that, by the way? Why are we so desperate to want to tell a friend that has just experienced a tragedy that God had nothing to do with it? Why? Because we're trying to preserve his goodness, right? Something bad happened, but God is good. We don't want them thinking God is bad, so we say God had nothing to do with it. But at the cost of what? At the cost of what? At the cost of his sovereignty. As Christians, we're not in the business of defending God. He needs no defending, he is God. As Christians, we're in the business of displaying God to be as he truly is, a God who is both. Both good and sovereign good and sovereign. We can't try to preserve one attribute of God at the cost of another. We can't do it. We have to point the world to a God who they could truly find comfort and hope in, right? Who they could truly find comfort and a hope in. After all, what comfort is there and what hope is there if we live in a world where truly horrific things happen even though God didn't want them to happen? What comfort is there and what hope is there in living in a world where horrible things happen outside of God's power and his control? Is that comfort? What comfort is there and what hope is there if you and I and the world goes through tragedies after tragedy without any good purpose that it's accomplishing, but it's merely the consequence of people's sins and the world's coincidences. No, when evil and suffering happens to us and in this world, the only answer that will truly bring comfort is the truth of God's good sovereignty. John Piper says, Pain and loss are bitter providences. Who has lived long in this world of woe without weeping, sometimes until the head throbs and there are no more tears? But oh, the folly of trying to lighten the ship of suffering by throwing God's governance overboard. The very thing the tilting ship needs in the storm is the ballast of God's good sovereignty, not the unburdening of deep and precious truth. What makes the crush of calamity sufferable is not that God shares our shock, but that his bitter providences are laden with the bounty of love. I love that. What makes suffering sufferable in this world is not the thought that God had nothing to do with it, 
but the thought that God had everything to do with it. The thought that God had everything to do with it and that he's in control and that he has a purpose and that he works all things for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. As Christians, we love that promise, don't we? That he works all things for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. But if God is not sovereign over all things, including suffering and evil, we have to throw Romans 8, 28 out the window. At best, at best we could say, God works some things for the good of those who love him. We can't claim all if God is not sovereign over all. And so through the bitter providence over Joseph's life, God was displaying not only the salvation of Joseph's family, but he was displaying the pattern of salvation by which he would save all of his people because centuries later, another one came to his brethren. Another one came to his own and they rejected him and they received him not. Another one was sold off for silver, betrayed by those closest to him. Another one was stripped naked, abandoned to cry, and in the darkness he cried, why? Why have you forsaken me? And no one answered. No one came. You see, God gave us the cross to be the ultimate picture of how God orchestrates suffering and evil for his glory and the good of his people. If you look at Acts 4, you'll see that Herod killed Jesus. You'll see that Pontius Pilate killed Jesus. You'll see that the Gentiles killed Jesus. You'll see that the Jews killed Jesus. If you look elsewhere, it'll say that you and I killed Jesus. And still elsewhere, it says that Satan killed Jesus. But who ultimately killed Jesus? Who was the one in control? Acts 4, 27 through 28. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan have predestined to take place. All these parties at work in their evil to scheme and kill Jesus. But they could only do that which God's hand and his plan had predestined to take place. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. Pilate's grasp at power, the soldier's cruel mockery, the spitting, the shredding, the nailing, the piercing, the crying of utter depravity, crucify him, crucify him. In those few hours was the climax of the greatest wickedness that the planet has ever known or will know, and God planned it all. He planned it all so that you and I might be saved. The sovereignty of God over suffering and evil, a truth of this magnitude has to be anchored in the cross or we'll be driven mad, we'll all go crazy. When the dark storm and suffering of evil strikes, we need more than theology, we need an anchor. We need an anchor and the anchor is this, that at the cross, God planned and he accomplished the greatest evil that anyone could ever commit. At the cross, he planned and he accomplished the greatest suffering anyone could ever endure so that through the cross, you and I might know and experience the greatest good we could ever imagine. That's the anchor. That's the cross. He gave us the cross so that we won't be driven mad by trying to come to terms with the fact that you just got cancer but God's the one that ultimately did it. That your child just died, but that God's the one that ultimately did it. That someone has truly committed an evil against you and you've suffered much and that person is responsible and guilty of their sins, but God's the one that ultimately did it. These things has, have driven people mad but it won't drive you mad if you say, he loves me, I'm his, and he is mine. And if at the cross he orchestrated 
the greatest evil and the greatest suffering for his greatest worship and my greatest good, then surely this evil too. Then surely this suffering too is for his glory and my good. If you stay anchored to the cross and move out from there to the point that you're able to handle, you'll be kept safe. Your mind will be safe, your heart will be safe, and not only safe, but you'll be invincible. In a world filled with suffering and evil, you won't sink because you'll be standing on the rock, anchored to the cross, immovable and unshakable. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your good sovereignty. We thank you that there's not a single thing in all the universe that could happen, and we say it was outside of your control. And we say it was outside of your design, and we say it was outside of your good pleasure, for your glory, for our good. Father, we pray that this anchor, this ballast of truth, that you are orchestrating everything, not just the good, but the bad, for your glory and our good would keep us safe and that it would make us invincible in this world. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.